Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll see a story on women uh, settlers from our Built on Agriculture documentary. But first, joining me right now is the North Dakota Census Office, uh, well, the manager of the North Dakota Census Office, Kevin Iverson. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Oh, today. thanks for having me. As we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm originally, a, I'm a North Dakota native, a graduate of UND, a resident, uh, a native of Bismarck, and uh, uh, grew up here, obviously, and uh, had lived uh, in North Dakota most of my life, although not all of my life. I'm a uh, Army uh, retiree, and uh, this is my second career, uh, what I'm in now, and uh, just having a great time of it. Uh, so you retired from the Army? Yes, Can sir. you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was uh, both active Army and then I, I was full-time uh, active Guard, uh, both in Grand Forks and Bismarck for several years. Uh, retired in 2005 at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and uh, went on to a second career after that. Well, we thank you for your service, well, too. Thank you. Well, how did you get involved in the census business? Well, that, <clears throat> that really is an uh, unusual story. I will tell you, it was never on the list of things I intended to do. I, I retired in Bismarck and I, I wanted to stay there and I was looking for some unique niche uh, opportunity, something unusual, and, and so I, uh, I focused on research, uh, which may sound kind of unusual, but uh, you had a little bit the advantage of, of having a fairly small number of research jobs, but also a, a fairly small pool of individuals to compete for those jobs. So I worked, uh, I went to work for uh, job service as a labor, labor market information analyst doing unemployment statistics for, for a number of years. Uh, I, <clears throat> from, from there, because uh, I could talk to the public. Uh, I ended up on the Census Advisory Committee, which was in Bismarck uh, at the time, it still exists. Uh, and uh, uh, when uh, Richard Rathke uh, re resigned or retired as the state demographer, uh, I was asked to, for a number of years, to keep the, the memorandums of agreement going between the state of North Dakota and the Census Bureau, which I did. I never expected I would get offered the full-time job when they, got, when they created that, but uh, in uh, 2013, they offered me the full-time job, and I took them up on the offer. Well, all right. With that said, what exactly do you do? <laughs> well, you know, we do a lot of, of different things. First of all, it's, it's a small staff. There's only two of us, uh, and <clears throat> I, I, w I think it's best explained by the memorandums of agreement that the the state has with the Census Bureau. Uh, we are the state data center, and so uh, we provide uh, interpretation of data, census data. Uh, to the to the public, we uh, do public presentations of the the demography of the state of North Dakota. We help individuals who have questions in terms of understanding uh, population statistics or social economic statistics of a, a given area. Uh, interpret that and and are able to to, to track that data. Uh, we're also uh, the uh, under a memorandum of agreement with the Census Bureau uh, for the population estimate program. We assist in, in uh, providing data to the Census Bureau, as well as reviewing their data in terms of the annual population estimates that are done, and, and the housing count that's done for the state of North Dakota. Uh, so we get involved in that. The last last agreement that we have has to do with the governor's liaison, and, and, and although that has been kind of a sleeper for us, we're going to get very busy uh, in that because that deals with the decennial census in 2020. And people may, may not realize uh, that much of the work for the census is done ahead of time. And if you think in terms of the Census Bureau, the ramp up for this, for this major effort once every year, well, those individuals and those, those employees don't exist uh, in the meantime. And so the Census Bureau has got to create that organization that goes out and does the, does the enumeration uh, of residents of the state of North Dakota. Um, we have a vested interest in them getting an accurate count. In 2010, we estimated for every individual that was not counted, it would cost the state $1,000 per year. So you, one individual over a 10 year period of time would be a, a cost to the state of $10,000. And so uh, you, you count, miscount 50 people, you're, you're dealing with some ser serious amount of, of capital that would that uh, would be uh, coming into the state for a period of time. So it's very important uh, that we get those numbers right. It's very important that they have the lead information they need in terms of, of things like the, like the geography, uh, how our, our incorporated cities have changed since then, uh, the boundary and annexation that, is, that has occurred within those cities, and, and so on, uh, to make sure that they can do the job uh, that, that they do. 
Uh, we certainly do help a lot of researchers out that have questions. Uh, demography uh, has a lot of applications uh, for a huge number and a, a large variety of researchers. Um, so we're, we're helping help uh, obtain that data and show, uh, recommend what sources. And even if, it's, even if it's not census data, certainly if it's employment statistics or tax numbers, we will help people get to the right data if it exists. And, mm -hmm. and not always, not, there's not always numbers out there, but in many cases there are to give people an indication of what's out there. Yeah, well, North Dakota is one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest yes. growing state. Uh, can you talk about that and what's contributing to that? Yeah, without doubt, uh, since the 2010, uh, almost every year for uh, 2011 through 2014, actually through 2015, I believe, we have been the fastest growing state, uh, growth of over 12%. Uh, without doubt, the uh, expansion of the oil industry in western North Dakota has been a major contributor uh, to that uh, to that growth. Uh, about <clears throat> three quarters of our uh, growth in the state has been accounted for by migration, in migration, although there is out migration in certain areas also, uh, but in migration into the state. Uh, I think also uh, certainly the, the uh, what's happening in the eastern part of the state is not necessarily reflective of what's happening in the west. I think the, especially the Fargo area has become a very diversified economy with time, is kind of growing naturally of its own. Uh, and so we have kind of two phenomenon happening at the same time in the state over the last few, last several years. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about the oil industry, a uh, little bit of downturn right now uh, with the oil industry. What impact is that having and what are you projecting the future of what that will have? Yeah, um, we, uh, we did population projections uh, two months ago that we released. They're, they're up on our website now. And uh, we anticipated continued growth over a, a period of time. We assumed uh, that things would not be as nearly exuberant as we saw in 2012, nor as pessimistic as we saw, as we're seeing right now, that there would be, a, uh, there would be ups and downs, but overall uh, we would see growth that's happening. The other thing that's really important to remember, uh, there is more of an indirect relationship with oil development and population change uh, than, than you might think. And, and what I mean by that is, I compare it to a ship at sea. If it's, it's stationary and you turn the engines on, that ship starts to move very slowly uh, at, at first, but will eventually pick up speed. And the same thing happens when you cut, the, cut those engines off. The engine, that, that, that uh, ship will coast for a long period of time before it comes to a complete, uh, complete stop. A lot of people look at the number of wells that are currently being drilled uh, and, and use that as an indication or asking, is that having a direct impact on our population? It has an indirect impact on our population. Most of those, most of those jobs that are associated uh, with oil drilling, and oil drilling specifically, uh, tend, to be lo tend to be individuals that are located out of state. They, they come in, they uh, stay in a man camp for a period of, uh, of two weeks, working 12 hour days and so on. But because of the nature in the industry, they may be drilling in one county, one one month or one week, and, the, and two weeks later, they're they're off to someplace else. That that rig will will move around uh, because of the nature of the the cycle of two weeks on, two weeks off. Most of those jobs, or many of those jobs, are held by out-of-state workers. Uh, those are not the jobs that I think really have had the impact in terms of the growth in North Dakota. It's more the gathering jobs, the eight to five jobs, where people have to go out and service that that equipment every day. And maintain there, and as that has grown up, as that has has grown in the state, uh, the number of workers, who I believe are resident workers, has also grown. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about you know in 2003, out migration was the word, yeah. uh, as a, sort of the catchphrase. Now, uh, you mentioned in migration, are 20 somethings uh, moving back into the state or yeah. coming to the state? <clears throat> yeah, it it seems to be the age range uh, of about 19 to 34 is the primary age range of individuals who are, are migrating. Uh, into the state, so we we have a we have a large peop, large number of people of younger in certainly in the twenties, the younger twenties, seems to be dominated by individuals about twenty three years of age, although it's you know it's not totally twenty three. It's it, there's certainly on down to some eighteen year olds and and up to thirty four and, and even older than that that we see uh, migrating into the state. Um, 
I like to compare it to as a kid, you know, and it's very easy for your parents to pick you up, you know, when you're when you're first born and you don't have a lot and you're not in school, it's very easy for you for for the parents to move with you, move someplace else and and, and it's not difficult. As you get a little older, it gets a little bit more difficult as you get towards high school. People want to maintain that stable environment as kids uh, kids graduate from high school. And so those individuals we see fewer and fewer of. But once they've graduated from high school, once they've moved on to their education, uh, we see a very dramatic uptick in the, in, in the migration by age that indicates that group is moving in. And, and I, think in, I think of in terms of the parents get tired of them and are ready, to move, ready for them to move out of the house. And then if you think as little later on in life, you get to your late 30s, you probably have a mortgage, you have a basement, you have jobs, you're established in the community, perhaps you're, you're, uh, you're a member of a church. It's much more difficult with time uh, for you to move. And so it becomes, uh, we see fewer and fewer of those individuals. So many of those individuals that moved out during the out-migration years of the 80s and 90s, they're in the age group now that they will not be returning to the state. So who we're seeing coming back into the state is a is much, uh, much younger group uh, than we're seeing, than we saw uh, leave the state earlier. Yeah. So where have been the biggest gains and, and the most losses uh, in uh, cities or counties, however you count it? Yeah, w without doubt, uh, percentage-wise, McKenzie County, uh, certainly the, uh, the Regent One, uh, McKenzie, uh, Williston, and, and Divide County have had the largest percentage gain uh, state followed by uh, probably the Minot region and the Dickinson region, those three regions in particular, but also the Fargo area. And, I, and again, I think Fargo has grown for a different reason uh, than we've seen in the western part of the state and Bismarck. Bismarck is, is kind of in, in between is, and has, got a, has seen a large uh, percentage of growth, I think about 14 percent since, uh, since the decennial census. Mm, okay. Uh, the biggest losses were? Well, those rural uh, those rural counties that are uh, outside the urban areas, uh, we still have urbanization happening. Uh, and so people, uh, th those counties that uh, have primarily an agricultural based economy uh, are seeing fewer and fewer individuals. So you could say the uh, kind of the northeastern counties with the exception of Grand Forks uh, from Jamestown, the, the Jamestown region, not, not Stutzman County itself so much as those counties that are south of uh, Stutzman County uh, kind of the uh, where we have the large German Irish excuse me uh, German Russian population, uh, that loss actually extends down into South Dakota, uh, so they're seeing a lot of out migration. Have seen some out migration in those areas, and they, they seem to uh, over time seeing smaller populations. Well, can you talk about uh, North Dakota's demographics and how it's changing? Um, yeah, in, in two ways. One is we've we've gotten younger uh, this decade. Uh, you know, when we, we got to the point of the 2010 decennial census, uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, were the 29th youngest state. In other words, we were an older than average state. As of, as of 2014, we were the fourth youngest state. Only Utah, Texas, and Alaska were younger than uh, North Dakota. And we had seen the most dramatic uh, reduction in, in median age uh, during that period of time. We don't have numbers yet for 2015, but I expect when we do this summer that they will show a continuation of the same pattern that we've seen uh, through 2014, uh, a larger, younger in-migration. And they're also, uh, especially in those areas impacted by the oil, the oil development, um, Williston, Dickinson, and Minot <clears throat> are seeing uh, an out-migration of older individuals who are either flowing into Bismarck or Fargo or appear to be moving out of state. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand uh, you recently uh, attended and hosted a uh, demographics conference. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, up until recently, uh, North Dakota was one of only three states that was not doing uh, some kind of annual or biennial uh, demographic conferences. And so the list had gotten very short. I believe South Dakota started theirs first one uh, three years ago, Montana uh, four years ago. Um, and we saw these as opportunities to really spread the word in terms of demography, uh, what's happening with the population. There, like I said earlier, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in what's happening with our population. We thought having a conference would be a good idea uh, because it really creates some synergy of, of discussions. Uh, it, certainly individuals from a, from a housing standpoint or from an economic standpoint or from a, a community development standpoint or the metropolitan areas all have a, have a particular interest and want 
in understanding what's happening uh, to our population and how that changes and how it presents challenges for the state as well as opportunities as, as we go on. Um, we saw this as an opportunity and, and, and certainly think we're going to be successful with that. Yeah. When a North Dakota sees refugees or new Americans uh, coming into the state, uh, where are they coming from? Um, we see uh, <clears throat> new Americans coming from Asia, Africa, uh, some from uh, Europe, y Ukrainians, Russians. Uh, th the reality is all over. Uh, some Indians, uh, we see a large uh, mix of individuals. Uh, it, it's, you know, where we used to see out migration in the state, and we were very much, uh, pretty much all uh, Northern European, uh, ca ca Caucasian or non uh, Caucasian, non Hispanic and uh, a small portion of American Indians, we're now seeing larger and larger uh, minority groups, blacks, Hispanics, uh, Asians, Pacific Islanders that are coming in the state. All, all those groups are growing uh, that we've seen. And certainly uh, our uh, international migration, uh, which we used to see very little in international migration, has gone up the last few years. Now, North Dakota is not a large state for international migration. Uh, but our numbers have grown substantially uh, over the last few years. Yeah. Well, you know, do, do you think uh, if the weather in North Dakota and, uh, you yeah. know, say Fargo's growing, it was 15 or 20 degrees uh, warmer in the winter, do you think, uh, you know, there'd be a lot more people coming to North Dakota? You know, that, that's really an interesting question. You know, if you, <clears throat> if you uh, look at Winnipeg, for instance, has a larger population than any city in North Dakota. Uh, they have uh, harsher winters than we do. Um, on the other hand, if you go further south, the makeup of the population certainly is different. Uh, I tend to believe that if it was warmer, uh, maybe a little bit, uh, certainly the makeup would be different. We probably won't see uh, individuals over 65, uh, maybe we won't see them uh, going quite as far or, or leaving uh, for winter, uh, having a second house in Arizona. Um, so maybe the makeup would make just a little different uh, in, in terms of what we'd find. Uh, I'm not convinced we would see a great, a great number of difference. Well, we don't have much more time, but can you talk just briefly about North Dakota's labor participation in our yeah. low unemployment? Well, there, there's two factors there. One is we have, we typically tie for, with Minnesota for the lowest unemployment, or excuse me, for, for the uh, highest labor force participation rate. Uh, North Dakota typically runs about 70% of our uh, number of individuals uh, age 16 and over in the labor force. Uh, about 70% of those individuals each year show up in the labor force. Uh, certainly there's been a reduction in the number of jobs the last few months, but there hasn't been a reduction in the uh, unemployment uh, statistics we, we've seen for the state. And primarily because uh, most of the job losses, I believe, have occurred to out-of-state workers. So our resident population still has job opportunities, uh, it, it seems. Uh, certainly as I drive around, I've, I've seen the help wanted signs still exist, so. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Well, with that said, we're, we're out of time. I got a lot more questions, but if people want to get more information, I want to find out more, where can they go? Well, we're at the Department of Commerce. They're certainly welcome to, to contact us. Uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, look on the Department of Commerce website, uh, there's a way to send questions to us. If you need us to give us a call, give us a call. We deal with the public every day and we're, we're glad to help. One last question, population in 10 years, do you see it reaching a million? Uh, no, I don't. I, I'm, I'm, our population estimate uh, projections right now, guessing somewhere about 925, okay. uh, but we don't think we're gonna hit a million. Right. Thank you, Kevin. You bet. Stay tuned for more. Life in the mid-19th century was tough for everyone on the windswept prairies of Manitoba. But it was the women who made a huge impact that allowed the prairies to be settled. Here's a segment from Prairie Public's documentary series, Built on Agriculture. It's been said that if men were the pioneers, women were the settlers. They were the ones that created a home out of some very, very sparse resources that they had to work with when people first arrived here. And they were doing this all the time while they were caring for and producing children, which were a major source of labor on the farm. And the day I was born, the thrashing crew pulled in that morning to start thrashing. And mother not only had to look after me, <laughs> she had to feed the thrashing gang. 
about a dozen men. And one of the neighbors came over to help her look after feeding the trashing crew. And a week later, she had a baby of her own. We had to make a living in the 30s, and mother had to help with the milking at night, and I did. We all learned because the men were busy with using horses to farm, and so it was a whole different era. We've seen the farm women's jobs change over time, as all jobs on the farm have changed. But they're still the home builders, and they're still feeding the family. In many cases, today it's the farm wife that leaves the farm to work, and it's her salary that helps to support the family. I think it's electricity has, was the bonus that came to all rural communities in 1947, because we had no electricity on the farm, so it was a role to be homemaker and you had to make the bread and if you did the milking then you had to put it through this cream separator which is a horrible thing to wash. But mother would print up 15 pounds of butter at a time and send them to Deloraine and that was the money for groceries. As these farms became established, the attention very quickly turned towards community structures that provided some civilization and social support to what they were doing on the land. The women's movement becoming very powerful through organizations like the Women's Institute organization, and many of the women who were key players in that were people who came from pioneer stock. I met one lady when I was working with WI telling me that when she was farming there, she would go to a WI meeting six miles away and she would walk with a baby in her arms, another one over her shoulder, and the little ones walking for six miles to cross a stream and go to that meeting and then come home and do the chores. The Women's Institute organization, which fought, of all things, for public restrooms, because in that time, women would come to town with the family. The men could go to the pubs but women weren't allowed there. There was no place for women and children to be, and that was the foundation of the restrooms. For a lot of women, Women's Institute was their only uh, contact as a group together. An older lady said that one of their members came in and she was pregnant and she had nine children already at home. The group gathered around her and just cried because family planning wasn't legal at that time. Cases like that, you feel that you've been right inside a person's heart. Though farmers, for the most part, were exempt from military service, and that doesn't mean they didn't go, but I think that's where one found the women taking a much bigger role in the management of agriculture. And I think when the fellows came back after the war, the ladies had taken over a certain amount of doing some of these things, and uh, I think we find a lot of farms now that the role played by women, particularly women who graduate with degrees in agriculture, more than half of the students taking agriculture at the University of Manitoba are women. The first woman, Dorothea Clark, graduated in 1922. It wasn't until 13 years later that the second woman graduated. And looking at the statistics, up until the mid-60s, from the time the college started until the mid-60s, there had been only 21 women students graduate. In the mid-90s, two of the years there, there's actually 75% of the student body were women. Now, it's about 50-50. Cora Hind was a woman who came to Western Canada in the early 1800s. She had uh, come out here to work as a school teacher and wanted to become a newspaper reporter. She was originally turned down. It was considered newspapers were no place for, for women to be. But she ultimately became the agricultural editor of the Winnipeg Free Press. And she took that job and created a persona around herself because of her very intuitive ability to judge how much the crops were going to produce. Every year, she traveled across Western Canada and looked at the crops and wrote what she thought that crop was going to produce. And she was remarkably accurate in her projections. And she was widely followed by anyone in the world that had an interest in what Western Canada was going to contribute to the world grain trade. 
She was also very active in the suffragette movement and very active in securing social supports for women. After fighting so hard to get a job working in the press, she was ultimately paid the best compliment she could have received at the time. Her colleagues reported that the best newspaper man in Western Canada was a woman, and that was E. Cora Hind. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week, and as always, thanks for watching. This program is funded by the members of Prairie Public.